From KDNK Community Access Radio, Carbondale, Colorado, in the United States, this is program number six of the Tactile Traveler, empowering blind and low vision people to explore the world and helping our sighted friends see the world in a new way. I'm Nick Eisenberg. When blind people go places, we don't experience things like our sighted friends. We don't see beautiful mountains or romantic sunsets. The goal of this program is to identify and even create experiences that are more meaningful or just more fun for us and our sighted traveling companions. Frequently, when people lose their eyesight, they become more and more isolated. The tactile traveler hopes to empower people to go not only literally around the world, but around the block to new adventures in their lives. Blind ranges from people who are visually impaired and glasses and contact lenses no longer allow them to lead a normal life to people like me who are totally blind to sighted parents who have a blind child, to blind parents who have sighted children, and people of all ages, interests, and physical abilities. Because of the coronavirus and social distancing, we have a challenging problem, producing a travel program for people who can't go anywhere. On today's program, we look at an increase in Charles Binet syndrome symptoms for some people who are social distancing and the way we might be able to reduce that increase. An interview with last year's winner of the James Holman Prize for Blind Ambition. A way to prevent hurting your back if you're blind in one eye a cell phone accessory that takes stress out of traveling, and tips on how to keep your guide dog and pet dogs in tip-top shape while social distancing. Our first story is about a problem some people have because they can't travel more than a short distance from their homes. It's an increase in Charles Binet syndrome symptoms. Charles Binet syndrome is a fascinating condition. I know some of your listeners might be familiar with it because you recently interviewed someone about it. It is a condition where people who have lost vision start to experience unusual visual symptoms, which have been described as hallucinations. They may start to see people. They may see forms or shapes. They may see animals. They may see places where they have been. And these may be specific things they have seen before or things that are similar to what they have seen before. And it's strikingly common in people who have lost vision for a wide variety of reasons. And it can occur in people even who don't have what we think of as severe vision loss. Any vision loss seems to potentially trigger it. University of Colorado Medical School professor and neuro-ophthalmologist Dr. Prem Subramanian, MD, PhD, Charles Binet syndrome is a normal part of going blind for many people. Dr. Subramanian said it can get worse as we get more isolated. Charles Binet syndrome almost by definition, is going to be worse when people are in an environment where they are not with others. So one of the features of Charles Binet syndrome, I mentioned that people have these hallucinations, seeing things that aren't there. They almost always recognize that those things aren't real. And one of the ways that they can distract themselves, if you want to think about it that way, is to go and do something else or to be interactive with another person or to be engaging in an activity. So now with the COVID-19 crisis and with people being told to stay at home and in that setting, it's known that people who suffer from Charles Bonnet syndrome are more likely to experience their symptoms. 
In addition, people who have the condition have been studied, and they have reported that when they are in a more isolated situation, their symptoms get worse. There are a lot of listeners who have Charles Binet syndrome who have been afraid to say anything to anyone because their doctors never told them that they might experience it. Or what's going on if they already have it? Eye doctors sometimes don't think about it because unless you are a neuro-ophthalmologist or maybe a retina specialist takes care of a lot of patients with decreased vision that we can't fix, we don't think about the fact that Charles Bonnet syndrome is pretty common. I think we also forget that patients can be really scared by this phenomenon and that they may think they're going crazy and they may not want to tell us that they're having the symptoms. So I, I think it's a combination of things. We as eye doctors don't like to admit that we can't fix some things and we don't maybe want to scare our patients by telling them they could have these hallucinations. I try to tell people about it proactively and I have been surprised by the number of patients who tell me, oh yeah, doctor, I've already experienced that. Thank you so much for mentioning it. I live alone and my Charles Binet syndrome went nuts. I had a hard time learning Braille, so I went to a hypnotherapist to see if he could help me. He didn't help me with Braille, but he did help me with some other things, and he taught me how to do self-hypnosis. So I thought I'd try it to see if I could eliminate my Charles Binet syndrome. The new patterns I've been seeing have almost disappeared. And I've been Charles Binet syndrome free for a couple of hours at a time. Dr. Subramanian was intrigued. So I made some phone calls to see if other people have found self-hypnosis to be useful. Judith Potts from Esme's Umbrella, the foundation working with people with Charles Binet syndrome in the United Kingdom, said she had heard of a couple of other people in England who have also been helped by self-hypnosis. My hypnotherapist was Lee Winder. Step one, know your outcome. What is it that you want to do, be, or have? State it in the affirmative. Instead of saying, I don't want to feel this way anymore, say, I feel strong, I feel healthy, I feel balanced, I feel compassionate, I feel driven, whatever the, the, the outcome is that you're looking for. State it in the phrase, I am, when you state it in the affirmative, all right? If you state it in terms of I am, it means you're already there which is about as soon as you could possibly want it. And these people say, well, my parents were like dictators. They used a very firm, blunt, direct tone of voice. And that has always worked well for me. An associate of Dr. Subramanian defines Charles Binet syndrome as when you start to lose your vision, your brain gets bored. So it creates hallucinations to keep busy. So my self-hypnosis consists of taking three deep breaths, each one a little bit longer and a little bit deeper, as I'm lying in bed waiting to fall asleep. And then saying to myself, my optic nerve and the part of the brain it connects to are relaxed, making me Charles Binet syndrome free. If self-hypnosis is helping you, please let us know by sending us an email to the tactile traveler at gmail.com. You're listening to the Tactile Traveler on KDNK. I'm Nick Eisenberg. In the midst of the pandemic, setting off on an across-the-globe journey seems like a distant dream. Fortunately, Mona Mankara is letting us live vicariously through her. The tactile traveler's Jason Struther speaks to her about her YouTube series, 
planes, trains, and canes. Even though Mona Mankara proudly displays her long white cane as she jet sets across four continents, sometimes she has to remind people, like this airport agent, that pointing to a departure gate isn't really helpful. In Planes, Trains, and Canes, Mona takes viewers along with her to show how a visually impaired person can travel across the globe. Hi, my name is Mona Mankara. My goal is to be like a blind Anthony Bourdain. He gave you a taste of the local food, I'll give you a taste of the local public transportation. Mona takes us from her home in Boston to London, Johannesburg, Istanbul, Singapore, and Tokyo. And all of her videos are audio described too. Crowded square with mosque in the background. Mona wrapped up her two-week international adventure just before the COVID-19 pandemic brought travel to a screeching halt. And now, like many of us, the 32-year-old is practicing social distancing. She's a bioengineering professor at Northeastern University and virtually teaching her courses. It's been a really interesting ride. I moved out into my family's home. We're all kind of here together. There's still the final exam. I'm trying to maintain my research. So I'm trying to think of it as mentally adventuring. <laughs> Planes, Trains, and Canes is sponsored by the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired's Holman Prize. It's an award aimed at inspiring people with low or no vision to explore the world. Mona explains she has just about 2% of her vision left in her left eye and only has some light perception in her right. She says she wanted to focus her video series on public transportation because many car-driving Americans don't realize how important mass transit is for people like her. A city with public transportation is a city that allows me to be free, to do what I want to do, to navigate efficiently. It's, it's very powerful, you know, as a blind person to be like, hey, I got this, like, even better than you, car driving person. <laughs> Let's face it, most American cities aren't known for their public transportation. Mona says London's underground was huge. The trains in Istanbul were very new, but it was Tokyo's metro system that made her a little jealous. Tokyo was the city that really like ruined me for, for public transportation anywhere else. Every train line had a different musical tone that played when the doors open. So you just knew which line you were getting. And some lines, apparently, if you ride from beginning to end, every stop had a different musical tone and would create like a song. I felt like I was in one big video game. But even though the city has accessible public transit and all these catchy jingles, Mona says something else was lacking. The second you step into a restaurant, there was so much automation that if you were by yourself as a blind person, I don't even know how you would be able to order food. Mona wasn't completely alone during her journey. Natalie, her camerawoman, came along with her, but the two had a pact. Mona wouldn't ask for help, and Natalie wouldn't offer it. Mona says it was the best way to film a documentary about traveling independently as a blind person. Natalie, number one, was extremely good at distancing herself from me. Like, she followed my lead, um, which requires a lot of trust, right? But there were a couple times when the pact had to be broken. Like when Mona was almost hit by a car in Johannesburg. A silver car comes out of nowhere. Wow! Wow! That was a close call. Mona meets plenty of people during her travels who were more than happy to help her with a bag or point her in the right direction. Excuse, is there a ramp? I can guide you there. That would be great. Thank you very much. No problem at all. Thank but sometimes she was ignored. Do you know where the lift is? Excuse me, which way to the central line? And now and then her smartphone was useless. Is that the one you're looking for? Yes. Perfect. Uh-oh. Lost the connection. Let me try that again. Perfect. I can call but there was one time when Mona faced real pushback while trying to assert her independence. Well, then, don't, then forget about Like, treat me like anybody else. We can't. I'm afraid. Why? A London transit worker told Mona that it was official policy to not allow unaccompanied blind people onto the train. He kept on saying it wasn't my choice, and I kept on trying to understand why it wasn't my choice to de decline this assistance. I think people project their fears of being blind upon us. How is it not my choice? But Mona pushed back, and in the end, she won. After checking the rules, the transit worker acknowledged that blind people do have the right to decline assistance.
Mona says she understands how solo travel can be intimidating or frustrating for visually impaired people. But through some of the downs and many of the ups of her own journey, Mona says she came away with an even greater sense of self-empowerment. The second I came to peace with being okay with getting lost or recognizing that I might not be as efficient as the next person in navigating, a weight was lifted. A state of mind was like achieved in being more free. Like I think th that is something I learned. I'm going on a safari tour! And while we all wait for things to get back to normal so we can head off on our own adventures, we at least have Mona's planes, trains, and canes, even if the videos do make us a little envious. Jason, how far along is Mona in her series of countries and cities? Well, Nick, Mona has wrapped up all of her world travels, and most of the videos have been uploaded to YouTube already. But her last two episodes on Singapore and Tokyo, they will drop throughout the rest of the spring. Where did she get the money to do this? The Planes, Trains, and Canes series uh, has been sponsored by the Holman Prize. Now, that's an award given out by the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. It's named after a 19th century blind British explorer who's perhaps the first visually impaired person to travel around the globe. So for the past few years, the Lighthouse in San Francisco has been offering this award to a handful of recipients uh, to encourage other people with visual impairments to travel. Thank you, Jason. It can be extra easy to hurt your back if you're blind in one eye or have one eye that sees much better than the other one. Lydia Eckert has a tip you might find useful. A good way to screw up your back is to bend and twist at the same time. When we drop things, our automatic response is immediately to bend down and pick them up. If you have vision in both eyes, you could see where things are and it makes it easier. A better way? is when you drop something, stop. Then turn your whole body so it's directly in front of you. Then bend from your knees and waist or kneel down to pick it up. And when you're reaching for a suitcase, make sure it's directly in front of you before you reach for it. Thank you, Lydia. Simon Bonifant has a report on a cell phone accessory that can take a lot of stress out of your life when you're traveling. It's called a battery pack. It's an extra battery that's about the size of my iPhone. I can use it to charge my iPhone when I'm out and not at home. I can use it to charge any other electronics that use a USB plug. It fits in a backpack or purse and it even fits in my pocket. I never have to worry about my phone dying. It takes a lot of stress out of traveling. They usually are designed to charge your phone for 24, 48, or 72 hours of continuous use. They even have battery packs that will talk, especially designed for us. It's called the Mophie Power Station. I got mine from Amazon for about $20. Thank you, Simon. You're listening to the Tactile Traveler, KDNK Community Access Radio. I'm Nick Eisenberg. Even though guide dogs are free to the people that use them, they're expensive to raise and train, fifty to $75,000 each, depending on how guide dog schools determine their costs. Plus, each dog requires a huge number of volunteers. For example, guide dogs of the desert in Palm Springs, California, figures that it takes 22 volunteers in addition to their paid staff to raise and train a dog at many guide dog schools. The blind and low vision people who use guide dogs are called handlers, and the handlers and their dogs make up a team. Since handlers have to practice social distancing, so do their dogs. That means their dogs are no longer crossing busy streets, using mass transit, going into restaurants, stores, offices, or just getting lots of exercise. It's important 
guide dogs don't lose all of the skills. So many people spent so much time and so much money helping them learn. Phyllis Chavez has some suggestions from experts on how to keep your guide dog in tip-top shape. You can use these tips on your pet dog, too. Think of this time as just an extension of inclement weather. When sidewalks are icy or it's just extreme temperatures one way or another, we can play with our dogs indoors. White cane and guide dog instructor Ellie Carlson. Dogs need mental stimulation and physical stimulation. It actually wears them out faster to do mind games, obedience, hide and seek, puppy push-ups, sit down, sit down, sit down. That will wear them out faster than a three-mile hike. Another popular way of, of keeping dogs enriched is puzzle toys that instead of feeding the dog's kibble into a traditional dog dish, you load the kibble into this puzzle toy and the dogs have to really work at how to open or manipulate and turn and roll this toy to dispense all the kibbles out of it. And it's going to take them a longer and keep them their mind active and their, their paws and their mouth active for a few minutes rather than just gulping down and inhaling a dish of food. Melissa Smith is the Colorado field trainer for Guiding Eyes for the Blind, Yorktown, New York. One of my favorite games to do with dogs in the house or even in the backyard is play hide and go seek. It's a really fun game. You know, Labradors are a hunting breed. So it really ignites that hunting instinct. And so they have a ton of fun with it. So basically you would have your dog sit and wait in a certain position in your house, or you can have a family member hold the dog and then you go hide somewhere and, you know, start out simple, hide behind a wall or behind an open door and then call your dog to you and they have to come find you. And as they get good at it, you can make it harder and harder depending on, you know, the layout of your home or backyard. And again, it, it's it's an obedience exercise because you're still working on calm. You're just making it into a more fun game. And when the dog finds you, I would still be armed with a good food reward or, you know, their favorite toy to have a game. And then you can go hide again. Or you can hold the dog and have your family member go hide and have them search for your family member. To be patient with your guide dog, check in with yourself. You have to take care of yourself first and foremost. And I think when we get anxious and stressed, our dogs pick up on that. You know, luckily the human animal bond is so strong. And I think that these dogs really provide a big, strong level of stress relief in, in, the, in itself. But just remember to be patient with your dog. I mean, this is stressful for all of us. And I think we're all struggling a little bit. But check in with yourself, breathe, take your time, you know, if you're frustrated or not in a good frame of mind, you know, maybe that's not a good time to do obedience. Have a game of hide and go seek or or maybe your dog just needs something to chew on so you can go have some time to yourself as well. Phyllis, how are things going with you and your guide dog? Kyla and I are doing very well. We take walks uh, daily and we do doggy push-ups. Thank you, Phyllis. We are very proud to announce that the Colorado Broadcasters Association has named the Tactile Traveler this year's best public affairs program for small and medium market stations. We're also proud to announce that beginning on program number five, we have become a radio program for the deaf. When you go to the Tactile Traveler on the internet, or as a podcast, you can now click on a link for a transcript of the program. That makes it possible for our deaf blind listeners to follow the show. Many people who are deaf blind have a digital braille display, which will act as a computer and upload the program directly, or will connect to the internet and change the text to braille. It's my talking scale, reminding us that we'd like you to weigh in on how we're doing. Please let us know by sending an email to the tactile traveler at gmail.com. We spell traveler the American way with one L. If you would like to help underwrite this program, please send us an email 
with underwriting in the subject line at the tactile traveler at gmail.com. This program is also being broadcast on the Audio Information Network of Colorado and additional states. It's also available by typing the tactile traveler into any search engine and is available wherever you get podcasts and by asking your smart speaker for the Tactile Traveler podcast. We'd like to thank the following people who made today's program possible. Microsoft Disability Tech Support, Apple Accessibility Tech Support, and Humanware Tech Support. Lorraine Hutchinson, John Grace, Paula Freund, Debbie O'Leary, Sophia Williams, Sarah Williams, Trevor Swank, Lucas Turner, and Raleigh Burley. I'm Nick Eisenberg. This has been the Tactile Traveler, empowering blind and low vision people to explore the world and helping our sighted friends see the world in a new way. This is a production of KDNK Community Access Radio, Carbondale, Colorado.